Hello and welcome back to the T Show where it's time, time to create thoughts. thoughts. Love it. We have an incredible show for you here today. But first, let me introduce myself. I'm Gabriel, one of the T guys, one of your hosts. Joining me is Poku Banks, one of the other T guys. And we've got a great show. Poku, who we got on? Yeah, starting off, we've got Karen Fu, who's one of the best Forex mentors in Asia. We're going to learn a lot from that one. We are indeed. And then straight after, we've got Greg Davis joining us, telling us how tasting wine can lead to good decisions mm. Boku doesn't have a great history with that but I suppose we'll find out a little bit more on the show we'll have to see where the correlation is we'll find out anyway it's time Let's to trade, trade thoughts with Karen Fee we're back welcome to the tea show we've got Karen Fee on before I even get started before I can even explain how many awards she's got I need to actually read it off a list Starting off with the best trading guru in Singapore, top popular analysts in Asia, best foreign market trainer in Asia, Women of the Future Southeast Asia Awards, and ranked number one in Singapore nationwide for its trading competitions. Karen Fu, what would you say is the best award and which means the most to you? The best award, I would say it would be the Women of the Future Southeast Asia Awards. That's a mouthful. Um, because I actually lost that award. You Be lost it? I got nominated for that award. So it's like a top five. But then I did not get the... Because the award is given to the first prize. And there's a second prize. And then I didn't get the award. So that taught me to be humble. And also to constantly work on myself. Because previously... All these awards, I mean, they are great. I'm grateful for it. But then it might cause me to become slightly more complacent. Whereas after that award, after I lost it, I think I cried for like two days. <laughs> then after that, after that, I, I recovered and then I stood back up. But then it, it, it caused me to become more motivated to improve for myself. So after that, I actually went back to backtesting more intensely and also reading a lot more books. And then consulting a lot of, consulting my mentors and all that. Mm -hmm. Whereas previously, before that, I was still doing those things, but I was not, it, was, it wasn't it was that intense. But after I lost that award, I'm like, man, maybe I'm not that good. So I kind of improve on myself and work on myself. Yeah. What type of trading style would you say you do and how you trade now? Right now, it's, uh, I don't know if you would have heard this strategy. It's called Global Macro. Strategy. I think I heard you mentioning it just now, global macro strategy. So basically, I look at the global macro factors. Then after that, I focus on the various markets. So if I'm trading Forex, I'm going to look at bond market, stock market for clues. Because what I do a lot is inter market analysis. Because other markets, let's say bond yields, it is often a leading indicator for the stock market. So oftentimes, not all the time, but oftentimes, when bond yields move, then stock market is going to move after words. Whereas for stock market, it is a leading indicator for another market like commodities market. So very often times during certain periods, when the stock market U-turns, bonds is going to wait, sorry, commodities is going to wait for a while, then it's going to follow. So I use this intermarket analysis as a leading indicator for certain currencies, certain commodities, and certain markets. Okay. Right. That was that was well explained because I think I'm following along now, so you definitely are understanding what's going on, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you got this. I got to check it out. It's very fun. It's very fun. It's a fun strategy. What what pairs, if in forest, would you say you trade? Uh, mainly the high yield pairs paired with the low yield pairs, because what hedge fund forest traders really do is that they also use a lot of macro global macro trading strategy. I don't know if you know this. Billionaire hedge fund manager. His name is Paul Tudor Jones. I don't know. Okay, you should you should know. I think you, we'll, you there we go. Before. he he he's a billionaire hedge fund manager, and he uses global macro trading strategy, and along with other hedge fund managers, which I forgot the name, but he's one of the most famous ones. So you gotta check it out. And what he does is that he also uses look at inter market analysis and then you look at fundamental analysis to make trading decisions. So the currencies the currency pairs that I use is Aussie N, 
or the yen because you have a high yield currency paired with a low yield currency. So what hedge fund forex traders do is that they use carry trading strategy. So they're going to look at the high yield currencies paired with the low yield currencies and they're going to trade using carry trading strategy. So carry trading is also a very popular trading strategy among hedge fund managers who trades forex. So they're going to look at Aussie yen, for example, and right now, USD yields are also very high, interest rates are also very high. So when it's paired with a super low yield currency like Japanese yen, it's, it has negative interest rates. So when you look at the interest rate differential, when it's very big, then hedge fund managers are going to buy that currency and it's going to go up. But when the interest rate differential decreases, 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 then that currency pair is going to go down. So if you just calculate the difference between the interest rates between the two currencies, you can more or less tell, okay, in the long term, this currency is going to go up or go down. You, you make it sound very simple. I have to I'll be honest. I'm sure it's more complicated than that, but I love the way that you're explaining it, even in terms of myself, who has little to no experience in trading. I'm understanding what you're saying. And I think that that brings me onto a topic that we heard about you in doing a bit of research before the show, which was you've said or you teach things about learn trading faster. So about work smart, not hard, these kind of policies. Can you explain a little bit more about how you teach in that manner? Some tips as to how you can make people learn to trade faster? So for working hard, we got to work hard. Okay, we got to work hard. Of course, that's, of course, we all we all know that. But then when it comes to working smart, that's actually a faster way to learn trading and that is to find a proper mentor. And not just any mentor because there are some good mentors out there. There are some bad mentors out there. When you find a good mentor, focus on that strategy and then just trade using that. And it's especially effective if that mentor strategy fits your own trading personality. Okay, so let's say if your mentor is a long-term trader and it fits your trading personality, then that just fits just right. Then you just focus on trading that strategy. You don't need to spend all that time Googling because it's going to take you forever to Google. And then for me last time when I first started out, I not only Google, but also I go to many, I told you, like I told you, different trading seminars. And I sat in, in so many of those sales pitches and seminars. To the point whereby I also know how to sell. So it's this yeah. idea that someone has that knowledge, go to them, take it from them rather than having to do all of the hard work yourself Focus on. and don't look at too many different strategies. Yeah. Just listen to what they're saying and if that resonates with you, go down that route. Yeah. Easy, yes. right, Poku? Yeah, no, I, no, I definitely agree with that because um, like you said, if you're going around on Google, YouTube, I feel like the internet is a big jigsaw puzzles so you're yeah. finding different pieces trying to piece it together whereas if you go directly to a mentor they have the whole blueprint step by step and you're more likely to succeed where you've got someone to ask questions with or whatnot yep just follow step by step that's great so then in terms of getting to where you are now there must have been lots of challenges along the way so what does your routine consist of what do people need to go through to be able to reach a position like yourself what habits do you have in place like you know times you're waking up or doing pre-analysis and whatnot. All right, so it's like a daily routine kind of thing. Let's do it. So yeah, it's it. Um, to be honest, you know, I walk. I I'm not a, I'm not a morning person, so I don't wake up like six a.m. five a.m. I mean, you go to YouTube and then you look at all these traders. They be like, I wake up at five a.m. Five a.m. and then do a hundred push-ups. <laughs> then go to the gym at <laughs> five a.m. I'm like, is the gym even open at five a.m. <laughs> Then he's like, oh, then I'm going to eat my salad, then um, meditate, and then journal. I'm like, oh my God, it's too much for me. So to be honest, I just wake up at 11 a.m. because I live in Singapore, so I trade mainly the London trading session and New York trading session. So it's like from 3 p.m. until 9 p.m. So as long as I wake up before 3 p.m., then it's all good. But one thing I do every single day is a must for me. I don't know why. I don't know whether it applies to you, you. I got work out every day. Every day? Every day. Otherwise, I'm just like, man, don't want to do anything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, uh, swimming every day. Yeah, I agree. Because with trading, 
you know, you're just sitting in your, in your, in your bum on your laptop doing nothing really. So it's good to get active and if, if you feel good, you know. You can tell Poku stays more active than I do, yeah. honestly. You've been going to the gym? Oh, oh yeah. Oh, yeah. Yep. I'm working on it. Yep. It's hard. Married life. Keep going in it. Keep. <laughs> so I got work out every day. And of course, you know, like basic, basic things, drink lots of water. Um, and learn, and then also like I must, I must for some reason I gotta read for one hour every single day. I just gotta read. If I don't read for one day, I'm like, do you know what something's missing? I'm still like, I couldn't sleep. And then because it also encourages me to improve myself every single day, and it's it feels just feels good to learn something new every single day. And then also, right now I try to meditate, but sometimes I can't sit still. So so. I try to meditate for like five minutes a day, but workout is the main thing I gotta do. Yeah, no, that's that's interesting. You mentioned three to nine, so that's the hours for a London session to New York. So then there must have been a lot of sacrifices in your life then, because three to nine p.m. to me is like prime time to meet your friends, go out to eat, do all sorts of things. So would you say then you've had to isolate yourself and just focus, like along your journey? Oh yeah, I've I've sacrificed a lot of. My time, I mean, my I sacrifice, in fact, my whole 20s to just fall on my craft in training because, like, you know, school, a lot of people in my school, like college, they're having the parties and all that, you know, that college life. <laughs> college life, I didn't have that because I was just in my dorm room or in my room or in my home just studying trading, studying financial markets because I want to be super good at it. I just want to be super good. I will be successful at it. And then also, I want to prove myself. I don't know prove to who, but I just want to prove to myself and maybe people around me that I am worth it. So I worked really hard in my 20s and didn't have a lot of parties. I I, I didn't, never went clubbing. I actually went by, I, I went for two hours, then I'm like, done. Done. The markets have opened, done. I'm going home. <laughs> and coming from... Singapore, um, obviously Singapore is a small country, but also quite a successful country. Firstly, is is trading big there? Is it quite common practice? Yeah, this because um, Singapore it has been rebranding itself as uh, they call themselves like financial hub, global financial hub. So there are a lot of hedge funds set up there, like Goldman Sachs and then JP Morgan, investment banks in fact. And I've been to a couple of those trading floors, investment banks, and you should look at their trading desk. It's like 10 screens for one person. I'm like, I'm your two eyes. How do you do that? So I only trade with three screens, in fact. And yes, in Singapore, trading is pretty common. And a lot of people, especially the older generation, older generation, they like to invest in stocks and bonds. So for the older generation in Singapore, they are more conservative. They like the more traditional assets. Whereas for the millennials and the, what do you call it, the younger ones? Gen Z. Gen Z, Gen Z. right, Gen Z. So they like the, you know, those crypto meme stocks. Yeah. You know, the exciting stuff. Then Forex, they like the volatile ones. I'm like, nah, not for me. Not for you. Yep. That's crazy. Very different to the UK, I would say. We're a much more conservative country in terms of the fact that there's not a lot of people here that trade or invest. Obviously, you've got the financial district in London itself, but it's like in terms of the everyday person, it's not so so common. And in terms of your personal experience, have you seen differences like from your cultural upbringing in terms of the way that you trade or your attitude towards trading towards perhaps people that you know around the around the world in the UK, Europe, USA? Are there differences between the way that you trade versus they trade just because of where you're from? Um, actually, why, if you could enlighten me, why is it that people here don't really trade any of this? People here are very conservative with their money. Really... L- lack of education around financial understanding. Okay. And there's just, it's a big um, saving okay. culture, I okay. think. Saving culture. Yeah, in fact, in Singapore, there's a good saving culture too, in fact. Again, the older generation, they, a lot of them, like, they prefer saving. A certain group of them, they prefer saving than investing and trading. Mm-hmm. Whereas the more of the risk-taker ones, they would invest in stocks, mainly Singapore stocks. 
but for Singapore stocks, you gotta buy like minimum one hundred shares, which is pretty crazy. Whereas for U.S. stocks, you only need to buy minimum one share. I have a lot of um uh, the the trading guru friends in Singapore, even though they live in Singapore, but they invest in U.S. stocks, so they don't even touch Singapore stocks because they don't really it doesn't really move. So that's not enough volatility to profit from it. Yeah. Do you, do you focus on events that happen in Asia, news events and whatnot, or do you look outside of global? Global. global. Yeah. Especially the G20 currencies that I trade. And right now, what are you looking at? What kind of things are grabbing your attention, either Singapore specific or globally when it comes to trading? Uh, mainly looking, still looking at the same few currencies that I trade, Aussie yen, because the yields, because Investors are expecting that the Fed is going to increase rates further, slightly, slightly, a little bit more. So what happens is that the high yield pair with the low yields, they are going to benefit from from Fed, what the Fed is going to do. Okay, even though next year, the interest rates might, might be cut down. Okay, so next year, a lot of people are saying that it's going to be a risk off, more of a risk off environment. But for now, I'm just looking at mainly the Aussie dollar, Aussie yen, New Zealand yen because New Zealand has a high yield too. Then Canadian yen. Because when Canadian yen moves, it's going to affect all prices. And then when all prices move, and it's going up right now, when all prices move, it's going to affect Canadian yen too. So a lot of times, I will look at oil. And then when I see that oil is moving, I will go to Canadian yen and make a trade. So it's like, it's kind of like, other markets giving you a free trading signal. Yeah. So you don't need to rely on any trading rules to give you any trading it, signals. So yeah. you, you like to um, use lots of confluences, lots of correlations and whatnot. Correlations, yep. Yeah. Correlations. To make sure, okay, that's interesting. Because I trade pound yen and pound. Um, gold and gold. I noticed that they negatively correlate. So sometimes when pound yen is going up, okay, I'm looking, I'm looking for shorts on, yep. on gold. So yeah, no, it's, it's good. Yep. Actually, pound is a, uh, high yield currency right now. Again, okay, when it's paired with yen, so it's a good currency to carry trade to. Yeah, lots of volatility. Yeah. Yeah. And it, but it's quite volatile. Yeah. Oh. Live tips on the podcast. Straight after this, Pokey's going to be straight online. <laughs> Make some changes to his trading attitudes and yeah. policies, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely, definitely. What about looking forward to the future? So 2024, any things that already exciting you, scaring you, things you want to stay away from, things you are ready to buy, um, or do you not look that far? Um, because I'm still sticking to the fact that next year is going to be a risk off. So what you what what I might do if it really does happen is to short those high yield pair with low yields. Because when it's risk off means that people are very scared to take risks. So this means that the high yield pair with the low yields are going to go down. So then all prices are going to go down. And then all the risk markets, the stock market, the oil market, the certain commodities, and New Zealand yen, Canadian yen, all these are going to go down. So the good thing about currencies is that you can short the market. And yeah, pretty much it. Just short the risk markets. And that's what I'm looking for right now. What's your favorite thing about trading i mean like being a trader is like you're your own boss you're your own boss there's no manager to answer to to let you know what you should do but then the downside of it is of course you not become as disciplined as compared to if you have a boss but one of the good thing is the time freedom that you have if you want to go on holiday you go if you want to take a break you just take a break if you want to work hard from morning until night time, you just go at it. So that's the good thing. And also, for trading, just for me, just for me, um, it encourages me to learn every single day. Encourages me to learn every single day. And also, every single day, the financial markets gives you a different thing. So it's not that boring. Every day is the same task. Every day is different. So that's what I like about it. The time freedom and also the variation of the things that you do yeah and then with the rise of ai you know and even the use of hedge funds using that 
do you think that affects your trading in any sort or do you make use of AI trading or using a bot? Yeah, you can you can actually use AI in many different ways. The first one is, of course, everybody right now, I'm sure you're using this to chat GBT. Yeah, using that. You can use that to generate trading ideas. Trading ideas. You can use that to summarize a financial article. Let's say you have a long, worthy financial article and you don't want to read it, a financial report, and you don't want to read it, just tell ChatGPT to summarize everything for you. But when you are a stock trader or investor, what you can take advantage of is companies that are implementing more AI into their operations. So let's say, for example, Microsoft, Google, Apple, and some other major big tech companies, they are implementing a lot of machine learning into the operations. So as they integrate more and more AI into the operations, then their stock price is going to go up and benefit from it. And someone for these companies, I've looked at the financials. It is very healthy, very good to hold long term. Of course, this is not investment advice, but then it's very good to invest and hold long term because they are constantly updating themselves and at the same time, they have good cash flow and at the same time, they have good reputation and branding. So it's like the perfect companies to buy into. Karen, thank you so much for sharing everything with us today. That was pretty impressive. And now straight over to Felicity Hanna, who's going to talk to us about the latest financial trending topics. Cheers, Gabriel. Hi, Pokey. It's never a quiet week. And once again, there's a huge amount to talk about. I'm going to take a look at why the dollar has been dominating, but why some analysts don't expect that to last. Plus, we keep hearing that AI is the future and undoubtedly it's going to transform our economies and our working lives in many ways. So why are so many AI-centered tech stocks down over the last few months? I'll be taking a look at that and also at exactly what the World Bank has said about its worries over Asia. Like I said, lots to talk about. Let's start with the story of the very strong dollar. The greenback has dominated almost every other major currency this year. And that's despite many analysts predicting it was going to weaken. Now, we talked last time about the latest moves from the Fed, leaving rates unchanged at a 22-year high. And since then, the central bank has hinted again that rates will need to stay high to bring down inflation. Plus, there's also an expectation that there might be another hike on the way this year. And that kind of high rate environment can be very attractive to overseas capital, and it generally increases a currency's value. But the global picture isn't just about a strong dollar. The US economy has been quite resilient despite hikes in interest rates. But if you look to Europe and to China, it's been more disappointing there. And that's definitely been reflected in their currencies. The euro is now at its lowest level against the dollar so far this year, nearly 105, and it fell 3% against the dollar in the third quarter. Europe, of course, is exposed to higher oil prices, and some analysts even think that if oil climbs well above $100 a barrel, up around the 110 mark, we might see euro-dollar parity again. I don't know if you remember when that happened last year. It was the first time in two decades Now, Britain hasn't fared much better. Sterling had a bad September against the dollar and against the euro, giving its weakest performance since December last year. And that's despite some positive news. There was revised official data showing that actually the economy performed better than we thought over COVID. But the Bank of England held interest rates in September. And for now, at least, sterling is still at a six-month low against the dollar. Now, I don't know about you, T guys, but it's very easy for me to get excited about AI, what it might mean for businesses, how it might change the workplace, what it might mean for our day to day lives. In fact, just a few days ago, JP Morgan's Jamie Dimon told Bloomberg TV that people's children could live to 100, not get cancer, and probably work three and a half days a week, all because of AI. And that sounds undeniably pretty good. And a lot of people clearly agree with him. It feels like every week we talk about how AI might end up doing a lot of the work that we currently need humans for. Yet despite the excitement, we saw some of the biggest AI-related stocks fall last month. That included the chip company NVIDIA, Microsoft, IBM. In fact, the largest tech stocks, the so-called Magnificent Seven, which is Apple, Microsoft, Alphabet, Amazon, NVIDIA, Tesla and Meta, they could all be said to have had a pretty shaky quarter. 
But Goldman Sachs strategists have argued that there could be strong earning results coming soon. And that's why they say that right now these stocks could be seen not as disappointing, but as cheap. Right, let's talk about the World Bank and its worries about Asia. It's predicting the most sluggish economic growth for the area since the late 1960s, so about half a century. It's downgraded its expectations for growth in East Asia and the Pacific to 5% this year. It had been predicting 5.1% just back in the spring. And you can probably guess the reason. It's fallout from that slowdown in China. In fact, if you look ahead to next year, it's predicting 4.4% growth for the world's second largest economy. And that's lower than the country's target of 5%. And remember, this is China. Even 5% would be quite low. And it's the same headwinds we've already been talking about on the last episode. It's within the Chinese economy, rising household debt, falling retail sales and exports, and concerns about the wider impact of that ongoing real estate crisis. Poku, Gabriel, I think we're going to be talking about the Chinese economy more and more over the coming weeks. But in the meantime, that's it from me. Back to you, T guys, in the studio. Thank you very much, Felicity, for sharing the latest financial news. And now to our next guest of the show, Greg Davis. Welcome. Thank you. I'm going to give you a quick intro because I think it's worth it just because of your background. So let's kick it off with you are head of behavioral finance at Oxford Risk. Correct. You have PhD studies in behavioral finance and academic affiliations. And you started the first ever behavioral finance team at Barclays in 2006. Six, okay. Yeah, I remember that year well. I was <laughs> nine. <laughs> um, but more importantly, uh, we said in the intro that you were going to talk to us a little bit about the link as to why wine tasting and drinking wine can lead to good decisions. Now, Poker is very confused about that because he's only ever experienced the opposite. Um, wine normally leads <laughs> to bad decisions. Are you happy to elaborate a little bit on that statement? I can. I mean, well, obviously drinking a little bit of wine is going to improve your decision making. Full stop, right? Yeah, yeah. Gets rid of the, the, the inhibitions, etc. But the real thing here is, is wine tasting. If you look at professional wine tasters, what they're trying to do every single time is make an accurate assessment of what's in the glass in front of them. And it's exceptionally difficult to do, much, much like investing. You want to make an accurate assessment of whether this thing is the one that you're going to buy. It's the thing that's going to go out. So in wine tasting, it's very difficult to do, partly because the more we drink, the, you know, the more... The more uh, our perceptions get skewed, et cetera, et cetera. And it turns out that in almost every form of decision-making, uh, psychologically, we humans display the same sort of biases and errors. And that means the way to fix it is very similar to what professional wine tasters will do when they're tasting wine. The sort of techniques and procedures they use to become better wine tasters are, are very close parallels to the same sort of techniques that we should all be using if we want to become better investors. So I know the link seems very tenuous at first, but it's it's definitely there. Okay, I'm getting closer. Yeah. I think we're on the way there. You have to share like some of those specific things. So you said yeah. there are some s specific skills that wine tasters use yeah. that you could quite easily cross straight over into in into investing. Well, it's it's more the um the message that's crossing over. Right. So let me give you an example. Um if you want to taste a wine and get it accurate, one of the main things that you want to know is what is the acid level in this wine. So you taste it, you swirl it around, you spit it out, whatever. I, I don't generally do that bit of it. But um, you taste it and you go, this wine feels acidic to me. But is it medium high? Is it medium, medium high? Is it, you know, objectively, where's that level of acidity? And if you've already tasted five or six wines, it's very difficult to, to really know because your perceptions are biased, your starting point is different. You're, you know. So you need to put in place a rule that, effectively removes your emotional self from the decision and gives you a measure that is much more accurate. Now, you'll like this because um, the measure that you will use to test an acidity is known in the, tr in the trade as the dribble test, right? My brain is a very biased subjective assessor of, of how much acidity is in a wine. But if I taste it and I swallow it and then I tip my head forward and I see how long it takes me to dribble, my salivary glands are, in fact, a very objective, accurate measure of the acidity levels in wine. So what we're trying to do is to replace a vague, 
emotionally led subjective assessment of something and replace it with a rule that we can use. And the same is true in investing. If you ask yourself the question, do I like this asset? It's completely the wrong question to ask because we're skewed by, oh, and I like their products, or I, I like their CEO, CEO is a you know, nice looking fellow. And you know, mm -hmm. we end up making decisions based on this completely subjective, biased, holistic assessment. What we need to ask is, can I break this, this, uh, this thing down? Can I find the dribble test for investing? I look at the accounts, it gives me measurable numbers that I can then use to make an assessment. And so what transfers from wine tasting to investing isn't specifically the dribble test, but it's the series of techniques that you use to become better and more accurate in wine has very direct parallels to the set of techniques that you should use as an investor to become better and, and more accurate. Pogo, I can already see us both going to buy our next investments and then leaning forward and seeing how we start dribbling. You're like, no, that is not the takeaway. But it would probably be quite amusing for like a YouTube video or something like that. Oh, definitely. definitely. <laughs> um, wine tasting, I think it's a good date. I can take a go and then I probably will mention so. Yes, that's very interesting to hear. So then leading on from that, would you, wait, would you say then in terms of investing, then that's helped you make a clearer decision in terms of looking the right, like, you know, factors and confluences to make the right decision. When we make decisions, whether it's wine or investing, and we make them from scratch in the heat of the moment, we're letting our emotions in. And we are responding to all sorts of things in the environment that are not, in fact, relevant to whether this is a good investment or not. And so what we want to do is almost take our emotional self out of the decision-making process. Um, and particularly if markets are volatile and turbulent, right? You, what you think, I've got to make a decision now. You in that emotionally charged situation is the worst possible decision maker you can be. So what you want to do for yourself is uh, in times when you have the space, you have the, I don't know, the bandwidth cognitively and emotionally, you start to write for yourself a set of rules that you can use to govern your investing. So that when the moment of stress comes, when the moment of crisis comes, you don't have to think, what am I going to do from scratch? You go to the rules that you've already established ahead of time that says, in times of stress, this is how I want to behave. This is the process I want to follow. And those rules initially can be very vague. But if you do it year after year, what you should be doing as an investor is going, how can I incrementally sharpen up my set of rules that I follow every single time I make a decision? And I'll just give one example of those rules. So every decision, if you want it to be a good decision, needs a pause point. It needs a, if, if you make a decision in your head, in your gut, and you immediately hit return, or you know, whatever, however your trade goes live, right? I hit return. You have not given yourself any space for reflection. So every single decision to be, to improve the quality of your decisions, very simple thing build a pause point in. And that may be something as simple as, I decide what I want to do, I make sure that I get up, I make myself a cup of coffee, and I sit down, and then if I still want to push return, I can push return. But for big decisions, it might be, I will not actually make this investment decision until I've slept on it overnight. Mm -hmm. So the, the size of your pause point depends on how much money is at stake, mm -hmm. what your level of competence is in that decision, et cetera. But if you don't have a pause point, you're missing out psychologically on the simplest single thing that can improve every decision that you make. It's so funny you say that because the same rules when I speak about personal finance online, there's another pretty much a mirror of that when you tell people about making large purchases. Yeah. Obviously, a large purchase could be an investment, but quite often the rule that personal finance you know, educators will say is the 30-day rule or the 24-hour rule. You're going to buy something that probably a bit outside of your budget. Yeah. Don't act on your gut. Give it a period of time and come back and make sure that the same you in a different scenario is going to make that same decision. Exactly. Um, and it's funny how that translates again across into obviously similar field, but different yet again. Decision making is decision making. The, the, the end goal is different, but the psychology is often the same. The fact that we are human, biased, fallible, and all we need to do is go, what can I put in place to overcome those, those, those fallibilities? By the way, I use that on my kids a lot. You know, they go into shop and it's always, I want that now. Yeah. And I've discovered that um, if you, you know, you don't want to come across as the harsh parents. So you say, well, you know, maybe you can have it, but in order for you to get it, you have to come to me in two days time 
and tell me that's a thing that you still want. You'd be astonished. 99% of things kids say they want in a shop at the time, they never, ever refer to again. And I think that's true of us as well. You know, you go into a shop, most shops are theater. They are there to separate you from your money. And the same is true of online shopping. So just having that pause point go, I'm not going to deny myself this thing I want to have. I'm just going to deny it to myself for 48 hours. And if the end of the 48 hours, it's still important to me, go for it. You'll save yourself a lot of money. 100%. What would you say are some you know, beginner tips? You know, we've all looked into um, you know, your investment constitution, so it'll be nice to hear what you have to say. I think a lot of people avoid investing for the wrong reasons. And often it's because they're, they're fearful. They, it looks complicated. It looks safe. What if I get it wrong? So there's a real, for many people, a huge emotional burden to getting invested. And I would say for most people, the biggest behavioral cost, most reliably reliable behavioral cost to investing is actually not what they do when they invest. And, you know, we can solve some of that with the investing rules and investing constitution. But the biggest cost for most people is they leave too much of their uh, available savings doing nothing in a bank account year after year after year. And that is enormously costly because even if I take that person and I put them in a completely tediously boring, moderate risk, passive ETF, asset allocation that's buy and sell, no engagement whatsoever, over time, that moderate risk portfolio should be expected to earn above what you would get in a bank account roughly in the region of 4 to 5% per year. If I'm leaving 4 to 5% per year on the sidelines because I'm emotionally uncomfortable, that is a phenomenally expensive way of getting to sleep better at night. And, and people are doing it all around the world. The amount of money sitting doing nothing, and, and we all should have some money sitting doing nothing. We need an emergency buffer. That's the thing that buys us the ticket to take the risk. But people are sitting with huge amounts of cash earning nothing year after year after year. So uh, the first thing I would say is create your safety buffer. Simple rules like four months of expenditure, but you know, make sure you've got something to fall back on that buys you the ticket to, to take risk. The rest, get it going, put it into the markets. And the reason why people are so behaviorally or emotionally um, anti this, some of it is just procrastination. I just don't get around to it or I'm not that interested. But for a lot of people, it's fear. It's fear that if I put my money into the markets and the markets turn down tomorrow, I, I've failed and I'll just keep it in the, in the bank account. And you hear these um, positions, oh, well, the stock market's just like a casino. In a sense, that's true. In the short term, the stock market is a bit like a casino. We don't know where it's going tomorrow or next month, et cetera. But here's the thing. If you go into a casino every day and play the roulette table day after day after day for years, you're going to lose, right? You're going to come out down because the odds are stacked in the house's favor. In investing, it's the opposite. If you go in and invest and you stay invested day after day after day after day, you're going to win. You are the house. And people don't get this. They think if I'm investing, I'm on the negative side of that. Actually, by sitting in cash in the bank account, that's when you're playing against the house and you're going to lose for sure. Yeah, there's inflation, eroding you, all sorts. And I like to just tell people, when people feel like they're investing, some people feel like they're losing their money, but no, you're transferring your wealth to another asset. Yeah. It's not it's not as if, oh yeah, your money's gone and you spent it on, on something tangible. Yeah. yeah. It's good to It's an interesting illustration of that. So imagine someone um inherits some money, some distant relative dies, leaves you a chunk of money. And think about one of two scenarios. One is so they have a they have a stock portfolio. And in the first scenario, that stock portfolio, the executives of the will, they sell everything, they turn it into cash, and they give you cash. In the second scenario, they go, well, we're not going to do that. We're just going to transfer all of the actual investments to your account. The same person in the same situation, but what they've just been given is two different starting portfolios. I guarantee that 10 years down the line, those two people will have very different returns because the person who's given the portfolio of stocks goes, oh, I'll just stick with that. The person who's given the cash has to go through the emotional turmoil of reinvesting all of that cash. And it's very difficult for people to do. To even translate that uh, to even someone that's not interested in investing, I think the stats came out recently that the amount of money that's still today sitting in accounts in the UK earning less than a percent is astronomical. When within seconds, you can find an account 
today paying four and a half, five percent easy access. And like you said, that's four percent, five percent that you're sleeping on within action. And we're not even talking about investing here. Yeah. We're talking about a saving secure account, things that people are used to, just because, like you mentioned, being passive um, and lack of action. But overall, I think that you've left people with good enough knowledge to hopefully take that leap, <laughs> especially if they're a beginner, to understand what they're missing out on on the table, as well as a bunch of other stuff that we spoke throughout the episode. So I want to just say thank you on behalf of myself and Poku. 100%. Okay. I've learned a lot for sure. Yeah, especially with behavioral finance, how it affects investments. Psychology is a big thing in trading. Yeah. So um, they even say, you know, whatever strategy you have, that isn't even up to 20%. It's more about your risk management, how you're feeling during the trades and after. So definitely behavioral finance is a big, big topic when it comes to trading. Cheers. Thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Absolute pleasure. <laughs> Poku, what a show. An unbelievable second show. I mean, we've been here for two episodes now. I'm so excited for what's to come. Yeah, for the season ahead. A lot of knowledge soaked in and a lot that needs to be applied on later on. So, 100%. When I said selfishly that I'm looking forward with this show to taking knowledge, like to, you know, increasing my own knowledge, I didn't realize it was going to be this rapid and this quick. But what was your favorite part, particularly from Karen? I want to know what you learned. Yeah, no, um, just understanding that, you know, she went through her own trials and tribulations, you know, taking her own sacrifices to get to where she is. I mean, also understanding that looking at interest rates and yields for different pairs and currencies can help you understand and take trade ideas. So that's definitely something I've learned, which I'll go away and I'll plan. Learn. But looking back to you, what did you learn a lot from Greg, the behavioral finance leader? Yeah, there was there was so much from Greg. I think the one thing that I'm going to pick up upon and that I'm going to apply to my own life were these ideas of applying investing rules. So he was speaking specifically about removing emotion and having a set of rules regardless of what was going on that you will live by. So when the market's volatile, when it's not volatile, you'll do the same thing every single time to make sure that your decision making is as strong as possible. And I think one of those few rules that I'm going to definitely apply is this idea of just waiting. He said, go for a cup of coffee or give yourself 24 hours. Just that pause before you make a decision, especially with investments. That's going to be one of my rules. I'll let you know the, the other ones when we come back in, in a few weeks. But now let's take a look forward at the next episode. Do you want to give a little sneak, yeah. sneak preview? Yeah, yeah. No, starting off, we've got Jason Sen, who is a veteran trader with 35 years of experience, who also worked in the London International Financial Futures and options exchange in the 80s and 90s. So a lot of industry knowledge will come from that. I'm excited for that one. And then straight after, we've got Hayley Quinn, who is an internationally recognized dating coach. I believe she has one of the biggest, if not the biggest, dating coaching company in the world. So Poku, ready to put on a nice shirt, maybe wear some aftershave. You're going to learn a few things, right? Yeah, no, definitely. And it'll be nice to see the link between money and dating and how that works. So, Because we can't figure that out right now for ourselves, can we? Yeah, no, the dating world is a treacherous place. <laughs> I'm married, so I'm not getting involved in this conversation. I, I wish, I wish, I wish, I wish. Oh, one day. But yeah, anyways, guys, in two weeks, we'll be here again. We'll be time to trade for it. Sweet. Let's go another episode.